No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I not know how to play, unfortunately. Although I did like that effect that uh, Vin had on the singing. That was all natural. <laughs> <laughs> Which one can I press to get that? Um, well, when I really want to emphasize a point, <laughs> then is there a Darth Vader option? <sighs> all right. I have music in front of me. If I put this in a pile, is that okay? Okay, now oh, I can't see. Now I can't see what's up there. Let's see. Should I just take it off and just walk around with it? Okay. Like a lounge singer. Hey. How are y'all doing tonight? So, all right. This is a very, this, I love this chapel, right? Chapel being appropriate. Has a very, uh, how old is the building, by the way? Really? Wow, so. Yeah, 1960. All right, so just so we can uh, plan accordingly, give me the time frame. If it's 6.10 right now. All right, till midnight. I have 82 slides we need to get through. So just uh, a five hour energy or something like that. Starbucks. So what, seven? Is that fair? Okay. All right, trivia question. Who remembers last month what, the, what we addressed? We spent our time on one issue, but a very important issue. Yes, Mr. Bez? The history of the actual writing manuscripts and why they're uh, as an Okay, good. Very nice. Extra credit to Bez. Um, how do we know that what we have here is what they wrote back then? So we looked at the manuscript evidence. It's called the, uh, the fancy schmancy name is textual criticism. And, that, and it's not criticism in terms of a negative term, but more so criticism in terms of investigation and uh, evaluation of trying to reconstruct the original for any ancient document. So a textual critic spends his or her time trying to reconstruct an original ancient document based on the manuscript evidence that's available. Okay, because we don't have the originals for ancient documents because they get destroyed for one reason or another. So that was laying the foundation not to tell us that the Bible is true or accurate because that's a separate issue, but has it been reliably preserved? And the beautiful thing is, just to sum it up in, in one or two sentences here, when, we use, when, when textual critics use the same criteria that they do for any ancient document to see if it's been reliably preserved, the, the, the Bible, and especially the New Testament, has better evidence than uh, other, any other ancient document, pretty much. And, and again, I always tell people, don't believe me just because I'm saying this, I always tell people, check this out yourselves, you, you will find the same, the same information. Am I okay feedback-wise? Are you guys getting any feedback? You're okay? All right. I'll clip it on. So tonight we're going from, was it reliably preserved to, did the gospel writers get it right? Now, now is it accurate? Now we'll, we'll, we'll talk about how can they be accurate? Um, I, I teach, this is an, um, an edited version of an eight-week class I've been doing at my, my church. And so we, we explore nine questions in eight weeks. And uh, this, this question is question number five. But we had an earlier one that discussed how do we know that the, the four names attached to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, how do we know that those are the people who wrote that? And so I'm not going to address that question tonight during the discussion or Q&A. If you want to talk more about that, we can. But I'm just going to make that the starting point. I'm going to just presuppose or assume that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay? Like I said, I, I have you know, slides and quotes, and we can discuss that, but I'm going to, that's the starting point for tonight. But here's the, the little upshot, though, the little one thing to think about in terms of those four writers. The reason why a book in the New Testament 
made it into the New Testament is because, not because early church fathers in the first few, three, four centuries decided this is what we want to be in the New Testament. They didn't create the New Testament. They discovered the New Testament. In other words, over time, the main question was this. Is this letter, is this writing connected to the apostles? If a letter or a book or a writing was connected to the apostles, either written by an apostle himself or by someone who was an associate of the apostles, it was immediately granted as authoritative and the level of scripture on the level of the Old Testament, okay? And within the first 100 years, 22, about 22 out of 27 of the New Testament books were seen as pretty authoritative. In other words, this is scripture. Second John, Third John, Revelation, um, Second Peter, and I believe James were over time. They weren't. They, they were still disputing because they wanted to make sure that someone who was an apostle or an associate wrote those. So those were the standouts. But by the fourth century, all twenty-seven books were uh, finalized, uh, at least in the Western Church. Now we might think, "Gosh, four centuries after Christ? That seems like such a long time." But remember. There's no faxes, no emails, no, no modern day even snail mail like we call it today. They didn't even have that. So a church in Rome, a church in Egypt, a church in Antioch, a church in Syria, a church in Jerusalem, <clears throat> pardon me, they are circulating and, and, and passing back and forth letters that are used in worship and in study and in community and in fellowship and so, if it's connected to apostle, it's scripture. If it's a, another one, if it's agreeing with the Old Testament, if it fits, if its teaching is congruent or similar, or a fulfillment of prophecy. If it, in other words, if, if, if a letter was going against what the Old Testament said, that, then they knew that God's not going to contradict himself. So that was not considered. And then the other one is widespread usage. If many churches are using a gospel, say the gospel of Luke, then they would say, okay, everyone's recognizing that this is Holy Scripture. But the main thing to keep in mind is what made it into the New Testament was, was it connected to an apostle. Again, the fancy schmancy term is apostolic authority. So, it's my little opening speech. So far, so good. Does that make sense? Okay, that's a very, very quick little summary of like, you know, two hours worth of class we had at, at church. But... With that said and done, how do we know that the, the writers of the, of the Gospels were able to tell the truth and willing to tell the truth? That's the question. Well, um, this is... Hey, Vin, if you press it one more time down, does it bring up the actual... Because this is from the opening of Luke. Ah, oh, there we go. Wait, there we go. So, to set this evening up... Um, Let's, the opening verses of Luke. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. If we had to categorize this, okay, uh, go back to English class. If we had to categorize this in a genre or a style of writing, would you call that poetry? Is that, is that a poem he's writing? Now, Bez is like, no. You guys agree with Bez? Remember, he got the first one right. <laughs> do I even need this? No. I was just thinking, like, do I even need this? All right. I got drunk with power. <laughs> Peter is good for the recording, though. <clears throat> oh, you're recording it. <laughs> I guess that would make a, a difference, yes. Um, if I get carpal tunnel, you guys are going to get me. Is that, is that recorded too now? Oh, no. Is Lawrence going to see this? He's going to yell at me. I see him at work. All right. <laughs> so yeah, not poetry. If you had to put this in a category, I mean, what is this? What's he trying? What's he telling us here? 
What's Luke telling us here? What's he trying to accomplish? Yeah, to set things right. You're all riding on Bess's coattails, I see. Um, setting things right. What else would you say? It's such a small group, we can do this little more interaction thing. A foreshadowing, meaning what? You say foreshadowing. Yeah, that's a nice way of putting it. Preface. That's good. That's a good, that's a, that's a good way of putting it. Notice it's not starting once upon a time, like a story or a fable. He's saying, just like what you guys were saying, I'm going to tell you what the situation is here. I'm going to give you some history. Now look, maybe Luke is wrong. Maybe Luke got everything wrong. But make no mistake about it, Luke's intention is to teach us the truth, at least the way he understands it. He's not trying to tell out uh, a fable or, or some made-up myth. He's saying, no, no, here's, opa. He's saying, here's what happened, and let me tell you the story. Now, who did he consult? He went to people who were eyewitnesses and other people who were there and knew Christ, knew the apostles. Was Luke an apostle? Was Luke one of the twelve? No. Isn't it odd that out of all the Gospels, out of all the people that you could have been in, the, that Luke made it? But who's Luke's connection? Paul. Luke was pals with Paul. Okay, so Luke is attempting to write history here. So with, with that laid out, let's proceed. Next one, Sir Vinneth. That's what Bez taught me to say, Vinneth. In fact, you know, you can put them all up there. That's fine. So, with that in mind, in terms of Luke is attempting to write history, and the reason why I focused on Luke is because of that opening is very, very direct. But also, if Luke got it right, the other Gospels pretty much line up with Luke, especially Matthew and Mark. John has some differences, but we'll just take it one step at a time. Here are some points. We'll go through them quickly, but I'm going to stop for questions along the way. Here are some things to keep in mind when we're thinking about the question, how do I know that they were accurate in what they wrote down? How is that possible? Because believe it or not, the oldest books in the New Testament, the earliest ones, are not the Gospels. Paul's letters are written even before the Gospels. And any New Testament, pretty much any New Testament scholar, whether they're a Christian or not Christian, is going to... to uh, Affirm that. Most say 1st and 2nd Thessalonians are the oldest. Late 40s, early 50s. So about 15 to 20 years after Christ. His death and resurrection. Okay, so but at this point, let me stop for questions, thoughts, comments, anything for clarification. Just, just a quick thing about the one, one more. Yeah. When he says... Can you go back now? I want to make sure I know what Bez is referring to. <laughs> okay, consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus. Um, I'm going to say no. It does not refer to necessarily chronological. Now, the, the, the term consecutive order, um, I'm trying to think of like other translations, how they have it. Here, what, what translation is this? Oh, the New Revised Standard. Let's see how they have it. I'm curious. If anyone else has another version. Because this because your your question is very oh, sorry. Your question is very good, Bez, because it goes into one of the points I have up on the next screen. Let's see how the new revised team. Servants had to after investing everything to careful. From the beginning. To write an orderly account for you. See, they have orderly accounts in the New Revised Standard. Most excellent Theophilus. And I would, I, I like orderly better than consecutive order because consecutive makes it seem like, um, well, yeah, from the beginning. He was born here at the age of one, this happened, the age of two, three, that chronological. And uh, that's one of the points I'm going to make on the next screen, that that's not the, the way that the gospel writers wrote. So that's a good question. I'm glad you 
brought that up earlier. Yeah, I'm going to argue, though, he's not necessarily writing. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying there's no chronological order in the Gospels. I'm not saying don't misunderstand. What I'm saying is the main goal of this type of writing is not chronological. Today, biographies are written that way. Say, you know, someone's writing about, uh, about Vin. He was born in this year, did the, and then it will chronicle the years in order. Ancient biographies didn't necessarily do that. They would focus on highlights of a person's life, of the hero's life, whether it's Julius Caesar, or whether it's uh, Alexander the Great, or whether it's even someone like Jesus. The style of writing for Roman and Greek biographies, ancient biographies, were highlighting main points. But we'll, we'll talk more about that. So, other thoughts, questions, comments? We are back. Okay. Um, did they get it right? First thing to keep in mind, and this is very different than our culture, is oral tradition. Oral tradition in terms of communicating and spreading information. In our day, and I'll connect this to number two, in our day we don't have to memorize anything. It's on our phones, it's on our laptop, it's on our tablets. And there's other gadgets I don't even know the names of. But I can pull it up on my phone, pull it up on my technological, technologically advanced device, so we don't need to memorize it. But even to this day, there are cultures around the world, whether in the Middle East or even, say, in Africa or, say, in South America, where they are still oral cultures. Tribal religions in Africa to this day don't have written scriptures. They have storytellers. And storytellers are highly valued in the community because these are stories that have been passed down for centuries. And we think of the game of telephone, you know, we're in a circle or in a line, you whisper something to the first person, then it goes down the line. What happens by the end? Huh? Someone in the middle changes the message. Yeah, exactly. So by the end, when the final person says it out loud, everyone has a good laugh. Because what began as one thing at the beginning, and so sometimes people think that's what happens with the gospel writers. They didn't write it down right away. Um, Mark is seen to be the earliest gospel, believe it or not. Matthew's, Matthew used to be considered the earliest gospel, but now these days most scholars think Mark was written first, and then Matthew and Luke, and John came later. But all in the first century. And by the way, any other gospel you hear about, the Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Matthew, Gospel of, I'm sorry, Gospel of Matthew, Gospel of Peter, Gospel of Mary, Gospel of Truth, um, any, or uh, the Gospel of Judas, anything that makes the news about another gospel, and then you think, oh my gosh, what is this? Is this something? They are dated, those gospels, the earliest in the second century. Which means the Gospel of Thomas wasn't written by Thomas, because he was dead by then. The Gospel of Peter was not written by Peter. He was dead by then. In fact, the Gospel of Mark, most people think it's what it's Peter dictating to Mark. It's like Peter's story, Peter's version of it. Because um, there's only one Gospel, but there's four versions of it in the New Testament. There's one Gospel, but four versions, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all telling the same story. But, some of them including different details at different times. So, we have the gospel writers in, in, a, in a culture where it's oral tradition, telling stories, memorizing, and it's memory and community. That's the point that's different than the game of telephone. Because instead of saying, and then down, it's, say I was telling you a story, and then Jesus, he only had five loaves and two fish. And then he, or say I said this, he only had four loaves and two fish. And then Bez is part of the, uh, Bez knows, he was there too, let's say, or he knows the story. No, 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 Peter, it wasn't four. It was five. You're right. Five loaves and two fish. There's a system of checks and balances in these types of cultures where they're correcting and they're saying, no, I was there, or uh, so-and-so was there, and this is what it is. So it's not the game of telephone whispering where it changes a million times, but rather there's people there who would know if I made a mistake. Now look, let me ask you guys. 
Is there a chance that the story can change, evolve over time? There is. So there is a human element. I'm not saying that even if there is that system, even if there is a community, can people, can a story change or grow and become false, at least in some parts? Yes. But there's a but to that, which is the third one. Rabbis and their students. Okay, this is a true story. Do you know that rabbis and their students back then <clears throat> many times memorized the first five books of the Old Testament? It gets freakier. Some of them memorized the entire Tanakh. In other words, the entire Old Testament they memorized. And we're thinking, what? I struggle with my verse a week system. Again, it's like a muscle, right? The memory. If, if that's the way you're brought up, if that's the culture, then that is not as odd to them as it would be to us. That's still pretty dang impressive. So if, if, <coughs> if, if rabbis who are teaching the word of God have their students memorizing word for word, and then you have someone like Jesus who is even sometimes called rabbi, right? I mean, he himself is a Jew. And by the way, everyone knows that everything about Christianity, everything about our faith is Jewish. A Jewish Messiah, Jewish disciples, most writers of the New Testament were Jewish, a fulfillment of the Jewish scriptures. I tell my classes at school, because I don't tell them my views. Uh, I don't tell them, I just try to remain, um, keep them guessing. I, I will sometimes sneak stuff in. I say, okay, you Christians in the class, if you want to be a good Christian, read your Old Testament. That's two-thirds of your Bible. And I'll see some Christians like nodding in the class. Like, yeah. You know. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so all that to say is if people are considering Jesus' words to be from God incarnate or, the, or if he's the Messiah, his words are on the same level as what a rabbi is teaching or what, what, what um, uh, the, the, the Hebrew scriptures are. So they're making the same effort to get it right because if they say like Peter, Lord, to whom shall we go? Only you have the words of eternal life. They're going to get the details right. And they're in a culture that has that capability because people are used to memorizing. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, yeah, more can be said on that, but I'm, I'm going to keep this clipping along. So, um, and that ties into multiple witnesses and sources. We tend to think that the New Testament is one book, or, the, or even the whole Bible is one book. But remember, it's 66 little books under one cover, written by about 40 different people over 1,500 years. In you know, some, you know, uh, Matthew was a tax collector. David a shepherd, and then a king. Luke, a physician. Paul, a rabbi. So different walks of life, sometimes written from prisons, sometimes written from ships, sometimes written from palaces, sometimes written from all uh, different types of settings. And here's the beautiful thing. Even though many of these people didn't even know each other personally, because over 1,500 years, their stories match. There's a through line that goes through the Bible when it's coming to address all the important questions in life. Who is God? Why are we here? What happens after we die? Do I have a soul? Who is Jesus? What's the problem with humanity? What's the solution? What's the purpose and meaning of life? What happens at the end, you know, after we die? All these important questions, which I think is pretty cool. I think it would be one, one way to know that this book is, is divinely guided, written by humans and by God. Which is interesting. What's, what's the Bible? The Word of God. It's, it's written by humans, but also God-inspired. What's Jesus? The Word of God. Fully human, fully God. Kind of a cool little comparison there. All right. So multiple witnesses, multiple sources. We have multiple witnesses, say, for an event like the resurrection. Because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are four separate witnesses. They are four separate sources. Paul is another source. James is another source. Peter. 
is another source. In other words, books from the New Testament. We tend to think, or critics or skeptics tend to think, wait a minute. That's all written by religious people, and they brush it off. I go, wait a minute, though. If these are historical documents, we can't all of a sudden say, you can't use the Bible as proof because they were religious or they believed in Jesus. Just as much as you can't say, well, you can't use your atheist arguments because those are written by atheists. The issue isn't who wrote it as much as, is it true? Was it accurate? So we have multiple witnesses and multiple sources. That, that gives historians more confidence that something is true. So say the death and resurrection of Jesus has multiple witnesses in the Old Testament itself. That's an important factor. It's not one verse written by one person. Remember, the, the, the New Testament is separate books under one cover. When they were writing letters, they didn't have books like we have and bound together like that. Oh, as far as written tradition, many think that because the disciples uh, say like Matthew, well, okay, trivia, what was Matthew's uh, occupation? Did he, ah, I'm dealing with pros here, they know their stuff. Tax collector. Well, he's working for the Roman government if he's a tax collector called by Jesus. Do you have to be educated to be a tax collector? Yes, well, he'll know how to read and write. So, again, I don't have any hard evidence for this, but it's not unlikely that Matthew, someone like Matthew, could be writing notes down over the three years while being with Jesus. So it wasn't, is it oral tradition? Yes. But could there be written sources? It's not, it's not outside the realm of possibility. And some of the other disciples could very well be literate as well. So that's just a, a quick little thing. Um, oh, and also another way that the disciples could get it right. Take, for example, the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, Matthew 5 through 7. Do you think that's the only time Jesus ever said those words? Behold, you've heard it said, do not murder. But I tell you, even if you're angry with your brother or have hate in your heart, you have murdered him in your heart. You know, that's an example from the Sermon on the Mount. Do you think that's the only time in three years he ever said those words? Absolutely not. He's going around from town to town, village to village, teaching and preaching and, and bringing the gospel. They're going to hear, the disciples and other eyewitnesses are going to hear some stories over and over and over again. And so it's like, oh, okay, and Jesus told a lot of parables. He told a lot of stories that you could memorize. It wasn't like memorizing the phone book. It was catchy stories. How many of us, how many songs do you think you have memorized? How many songs in your iPod? Or how many movie lines do you have memorized? A lot. And I know that songs are catchy and they rhyme and they're music form so it's easy to remember. But think of how many songs we can rattle off by heart without even trying. I mean, do we sit down with the music and the lyrics from you know, metrolyrics.com or something, or azlyrics.com? And say, okay, I'm going to memorize it. No, we just, it's over and over. We've said this over and over again. And those aren't even the most important things in life. Well, some songs might be, depending on the lyrics. Okay. Still read ahead. Led Zeppelin. Um, so that's another factor. Again, what we're doing is making a, a, a big picture, a cumulative case on some reasons to have confidence that the disciples got it right. At this point, questions, thoughts, comments. You guys doing okay? Is this interesting? I can talk about something else completely. Put my hand under my armpit and make that noise. <laughs> Is this making sense? Yes. It's like I'm talking fast to... to uh... So how do we know that things are rightly preserved and how do we know that they got it right? So... The next point, many of Jesus' sayings facilitates memorization. Um, it goes kind of over and over with the, uh, the last point. It overlaps. Whether by use of story or use of shocking imagery, some of these things are easy to remember for the audience. Okay, prodigal son. Who knows that uh, parable? Any prodigal son in the house? That's about as hip as I, as I get. 